Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is December 21, 1975, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 7. As I celebrate Christmas with my family a few days from now, I will be thanking God for the precious gift He has given to all of us this year, the gift of time. Because, my friend, the year 1975, even as difficult and trying as it has been, was a year of reprieve due to delays in the timetable of the four Rockefeller brothers. At this very moment some important parts of their plan are as much as one year behind schedule, and in the meantime more and more Americans have been awakening to the truth of what is going on. Yes, we have been granted a little more time than we might have had to respond to the menace we all face but we dare not relax and waste whatever time we have left. The four Rockefeller brothers are working feverishly to make up for lost time. Overseas the way is being paved for war, including that nightmare the world has feared for 30 years, nuclear war. Here at home our economic woes are getting worse, while a corrupt government controlled by the Rockefeller Brothers, tells us prosperity is just around the corner. Preparations for the dictatorial new Rockefeller Constitution keep marching on, and the man who has conspired for 20 years to become our first dictator, Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller, stands poised at the threshold, ready to seize the Presidency. That is why it is so important that more and more alert Americans are now asking just one question, what can I do? I am convinced that now, at last, there are enough of us to launch a successful rescue of our great free Republic. Therefore, I have just unveiled a strategy for action which I truly believe can and will save our country. It is a strategy which you, as an individual, can undertake starting right where you are. It uses the powers you are granted by the most basic law of the land, our present United States Constitution. And if you will faithfully do your part, you can rest assured others all over America will be doing theirs too. The result, if we will each do our own part, is a plan of action which, in my opinion, cannot be stopped. This entire plan of action is presented in a new AUDIO BOOK recorded December 15, 1975 and it's entitled, What We Can Do to Save America. And it is my answer to the question, What Can I Do? The challenge before us, my friend, is to regain control of the government that belongs to us, and we must act quickly before that control, which is already in the hands of the Rockefeller Brothers, slips forever beyond our reach. Control, that is the word, more than any other that sums up the actions of the four Rockefeller Brothers. Control is both the end toward which they work and the means by which they extend their reach still further. Control of money and of government, control of industry and of big labor, control of natural resources and of human resources. The incredible financial wealth of the Rockefellers is actually nothing more than a result of this insatiable drive for control, and it grows continuously due to their control over your money, your resources, your labor, and your government. They believe they have a right to do all these things 
because they are convinced that they have been divinely ordained to rule the world. So for example, using the CIA for their own private purposes is right and proper according to their concept of themselves as America's royal family. It matters not what you and I think, only they know best. All of this and much more is made clear in the book that was written for them as their Mein Kampf in 1930, The American Rich by Hoffman Nickerson. Today I want to discuss three topics that point out some of the fruits of such control by the Rockefeller Brothers. Topic No. 1. How political control produces cover-ups and paralysis instead of truth and action. Topic No. 2. How economic control produces deepening artificial depression and monetary chaos instead of real prosperity. And Topic No. 3. How the alliance between Rockefeller Corporate Socialism and Soviet State Socialism is taking us into nuclear war. Topic No. 1. In their drive for control, the Rockefellers are trying to snare us all in their giant trap, catch us so that we cannot wrestle free or fight back. But they know that if they move too quickly, we may notice what they are up to and react to protect ourselves. So they have been moving with great patience and determination over a period of several decades to get their trap assembled and in place, ready to spring it on all of us. To understand what is really happening, therefore, you should do as they do. Look at long spans of time, compress them in your mind, and see where things are really headed. Gradualism is the tactic now being used, while TV, sports, and other distractions are being used to focus people's attention away from what is really happening. Thus, even while many people find the idea of a new Constitution for America preposterous, many of its provisions are already being put in place, ready for ratification by a national referendum in the near future. The Federal Government already regards the United States as divided up into ten regions the forerunners of the ten so-called new states. The Federal Election Commission, along with some other activities, is the forerunner of the electoral branch, and so on. So keep your eye on their objective, that is, the direction in which they are moving events, so that you won't be fooled by their shifts in timing to meet their various contingency plans. The secret new Constitution which was developed over a ten-year period to fit the outline laid down personally by Nelson Rockefeller himself, just as he did our present 25th Amendment, this secret new Constitution is coming sooner or later, unless we stop it once and for all. As former Senator Sam Irwin said so emphatically just a few days ago, and I quote, We don't need a new Constitution. Ours has weathered many storms in the past 200 years. It was written to last for the ages." Unquote. But my friend, if we leave the Rockefeller machine in control of our government, our communications media, and our economy, we will have a dictatorial new Constitution. Senator Irvin is quoted as saying something else, too, and it is supremely ironic. Concerning Richard Nixon, he said, quote, he had the most pronounced, aggravated notion about the powers of the Presidency. He envisioned the President as being something of an absolute monarch." Unquote. However well these words may have applied to Nixon, they apply far better to the man who made, used, and then unmade Nixon, that is, Nelson Rockefeller. Perhaps Senator Irvin himself now realizes how cleverly he was used in the Watergate coup d'etat since he said last spring, and I quote, If I had known then what I know now, I would never have voted to confirm Nelson Rockefeller, unquote. 
Whenever possible, the Rockefeller brothers maneuver people into doing what they want done without their puppets even being aware of it, not at least until later. But the Rockefeller style also includes more solid avenues of control over all sides, if possible, in every arena, including that of politics. Thus, for example, the Rockefellers have their hooks equally deep into both the Democratic and Republican parties as well as fringe political fronts, both left and right. And while they have often found it advantageous to maintain a so-called liberal image with their public relations, they are not true liberals any more than certain of their lackeys who wear the conservative label are true conservatives. As Nelson Rockefeller himself said in Dallas on September 12, 1975, and I quote, Conservative and liberal to me are misleading as labels." Unquote. These and other similar labels have completely lost any utility they may once have had thanks to their control by the Rockefeller Brothers. Their only true loyalty is to themselves, and that transcends all of the conventional boundaries of political affiliation. A perfect example of Rockefeller control of all sides of a political situation is before us right now in the alleged Presidential campaign. I say alleged because there is no doubt at all as to the outcome under the Rockefeller scenario. Instead, the game is being played for other reasons. For the moment, the most prominent players on the stage are four. Humphrey, Reagan, Ford, and his ventriloquist Rockefeller. Hubert Humphrey wears a big label that reads, Liberal Democrat, while the equally large label on Ronald Reagan reads, Conservative Republican. President Ford's label is a large question mark. Nelson Rockefeller's label, which by the way is made of solid gold, is rather large. It reads, Liberal New Deal Democrat turned instant conservative Republican." Unquote. It looks like quite a field, doesn't it? But it so happens that Nelson Rockefeller has the other three in the palm of his hand, and his own label is only for show. Hubert Humphrey is currently the beneficiary of the so-called Humphrey Phenomenon, an undeclared candidacy that is being made to look impressive by the Rockefeller major media and by polls which can easily be manipulated. Humphrey's well-concealed control of a huge, major multinational oil company for over 20 years has been very helpful to his Rockefeller supporters behind the scenes. Partly for this reason, a possible multi-million dollar tax case against him by the Internal Revenue Service has been covered up under Presidential Seal, and the IRS FBI agents who worked on the case are no longer around. Ronald Reagan, of course, is the polished actor who has been rehearsing so-called conservative lines ever since 1950. That was the year when during Congressional hearings he officially admitted his previously ultra liberal activities, but claimed that he had seen the light and was turning over a new leaf. Yet his actions, as sharply distinguished from his words, have never really changed. He has maintained many active ties with Rockefeller-dominated organizations, such as their complex of governmental control groups known collectively as 1313 in Chicago. The Reagan Administration in California was heavily populated with people from the Rockefeller stables, and the Reagan record in California parallels that of Rockefeller in New York in many ways. But Reagan has consistently spoken as if his views and policies were totally opposite to those of Rockefeller. Reagan's service on Rockefeller's CIA cover-up commission earlier this year, therefore, help to quiet the cover-up fears of some who are not aware of Reagan's strong Rockefeller ties. 
Uh, President Ford is where he is uh, because the uh, then President Nixon uh, double-crossed his boss, Nelson Rockefeller. When Agnew was forced to resign, Nixon was supposed to nominate Rockefeller, but Nixon could see where that would lead. So instead, he selected Gerald Ford, whose political star had risen considerably after his participation in the work in defense of the Warren Commission. Good old Jerry was well known and well liked by his colleagues, yet his confirmation hearings bogged down unexpectedly. Behind the scenes, Nelson Rockefeller applied the brakes until Ford agreed to nominate him, Rockefeller, upon Nixon's departure from the presidency. Once the agreement was reached, Ford's confirmation hearings uh, rapidly concluded favorably, and Nelson Rockefeller immediately resigned as Governor of New York, surreptitiously moved into his Washington, D.C. residence, and personally finished watergating Nixon out of the White House. Nelson was so proud of his success in this project that he wrote to a banker friend in Mexico afterward to tell him all about it. Can you imagine? Thus Rockefeller control denies us any real choice in national politics. Ultimately, the Rockefellers choose all the presidential candidates that count and have ever since uh, Woodrow Wilson's time. We, the voters, are then given the useless privilege of choosing which of their hand-picked puppets we want, just like they do in Soviet Russia. Even in the election itself, the deck is stacked in favor of their preferred choice, but just in case, they control the other side too. If this isn't taxation without representation, I don't know what it is. In Congress, too, most of our politicians end up in the Rockefeller pocket one way or another. Some deliberately throw in their lot with the Rockefellers and become active Rockefeller agents. Others become compromised by skeletons in their closets and are pawns in the Rockefeller game of blackmail and double-cross here in Washington, and still others just go along to get along not rocking the boat. And so when government abuses become so flagrant that they are detected, we are still left without recourse because the Rockefellers control the investigations in almost every case. As I speak to you, the ante has gone up due to the leakage of radioactive plutonium-239 superpoison from the bullion depository at Fort Knox and the government is doing nothing whatsoever to stop it. My previous information was that the region which has been primarily affected by the leakage over the past several years consists of a swath through Kentucky, my home state of West Virginia, and Virginia with a combined population of over 9 million people. But on November 8, 1975, a secret meeting was held in the White House to discuss alternative means of disposing of the deadly poison. The discussion included some ideas that would be as insane as the poison itself, such as dumping all 60 pounds of it into the underground streams that lie under Fort Knox. Not only might this allow the poison to spread uncontrollably from there, but it could possibly also cause contamination of any of the huge underground caverns under Fort Knox, which are used for natural gas storage. Now if this were to happen, natural gas could carry traces of the radioactive plutonium poison straight into the industrial plants and homes of thousands of people in that area. The deadly plutonium radiation would be unaffected by passing through gas flames, after which it could be inhaled or set on to food. I received no further information concerning the action, if any, taken after the November 8 White House meeting, but I have received updated information to the effect that the poison is now spreading throughout the entire southeast of the United States and even beginning to enter the Gulf of Mexico. Thirty-six 
million Americans are now at stake. And what is our government doing about it? Nothing. The White House meeting had only one purpose, to save face for the wrongdoers, not to save 36 million lives. And what about Congress and all those investigations we keep hearing about? Consider Senator Frank Church, who is our newest Presidential candidate. On November 20, 1975, he explained the release of his Committee's report about assassination plots on foreign leaders with the words, and I quote, the people were entitled to know what went wrong and why, unquote. But when it comes to an immediate, deadly danger to all of us caused by the same elements of the intelligence community, apparently Senator Church believes we are not entitled to know since he has been covering up this vital information now for four months while the situation grows steadily worse. And for, for over two months the same has been true of his counterpart in the House, Congressman Otis Pike. Meanwhile, what else is happening in the Executive Branch, specifically the Treasury Department? My friend, I believe it is time to let you in on an example of the evasions, half-truths, and distortions which Rockefeller bureaucrats use to cover their tracks. I call it a lesson in bureaucratic gobbledygook, the slippery language that some people also call double talk. For over three months now, all of our attempts even to communicate directly with the government about the twin disasters at Fort Knox have met with nothing but a very loud silence. Having deepened and confirmed their own guilt time and again through various slips in the past, they apparently no longer have the courage or the courtesy even to answer us. Through an indirect channel, however, we were able to extract a letter from Mrs. Mary Brooks the Director of the Mint, dated November 21, 1975. This indirect channel is Congressman Kenneth Robinson of Virginia, who, while he does not choose to pursue the Fort Knox matter on his own, has at least cooperated with us in ways such as this. In this regard, he is exceptional. No one else in the entire United States Congress has done even this much. As I read the letter, try if you can, to find any clear-cut yes or no type answer to anything. You will only find one to the effect that a certain statement, and I quote, is simply not true, unquote. But the statement referred to is not our statement, but a carefully selected misstatement of our charges by someone else. Now here's the letter. Dear Mr. Robinson, thank you for your letter of November 10, 1975, concerning allegations that plutonium-239 was stored in the so-called Central Core Vault at the United States Bowling Depository, Fort Knox, Kentucky. We do not store plutonium-239 or any other radioactive substance at the depository and have no reason to believe that it is stored there by other government agencies. We authorized the military at Fort Knox to make radiation tests in the depository last week. We were informed that the tests did not disclose any evidence of radioactive material. The allegations relating to the so-called Central Core Vault are carried in a Swiss newsletter entitled Myers Finance and Energy that is currently being circulated by those who are persistent with all the wild allegations about the bullying depository at Fort Knox. The newsletter discusses Dr. Peter D. Beter's allegations and states, and the letter quotes as follows, In 1942-43, Major Stanley Tatum, T-A-T-O-M, designed and oversaw the construction of a central core vault below the main vault. 
To get to this ultra-safe vault, an elevator had to be installed, and it used up the space occupied by twelve of the former vault compartments. This explains why the numbering in the vault corp compartments upstairs had a twelve-digit gap." Unquote. And Mrs. Brooks' letters con letter continues, and I quote, This statement is simply not true. There were no major alterations to the vault after construction of the depository was completed in 1936. The elevator was installed at the time the depository was constructed. We have no record of Major Stanley Tatum, T-A-T-O-M, designing or overseeing the construction of a central core vault. In fact, we do not and find no record that we ever did refer to any part of the depository by that name. The visitor's log at the depository does show the name of Major Daniel F. Tatum, T-A-T-U-M, as coined on the office in charge, officer in charge on July 29, 1942. We also have records which show that a steel door was erected by the Champion Wire and Iron Works, Louisville, Kentucky, at the entrance to the corridor that leads to compartments numbered 1 through 14 in the basement level of the depository. This work was completed on January 7, 1942, and the number 15 was assigned to the door. After this work was completed, gold was stored in the corridor for a time during which the door was locked and, steel, uh, and sealed. Still quoting from her letter, the allegation that there is a 12-digit gap in the numbering of compartments is also inaccurate. Our records show that the depository uh, had 28 compartments, 14 on the lower level and 14 on the upper level at the time of construction. The compartments on the lower level were numbered 1 through 14, and the corridor door was numbered 15 when it was added in 1942. The compartments on the upper level were numbered 21 through 34. There is no record of the numbers 16 through 20 ever being used on vault compartments of the depository. If I can be of further assistance in this matter, please let me know. Sincerely, and there follows the signature of Mary Brooks, Director of the Mint. My friend, letters like this one are the product of a year and a half of continuous effort on their part to refine their story and put their very best foot forward. They are written with great care, with careful choice of every word. The letter I have just read to you, in fact, was not even written by Mary Brooks alone. Much of it was written by an official in the General Accounting Office who has ties to the intelligence industry. The GAO itself is implicated in the Fort Knox cover-up through the falsified gold audit done in the fall of 1974. So this letter is important, and it deserves closer examination. First, why does the government deliberately go so far out of its way to Switzerland, no less, to find someone else's misstatement of the bullion depository modifications so that they can attack that instead of refuting our own statements. If they can refute our actual charges, why don't they do it? I invite the government to listen to my monthly audio letter number two for July 1975 and respond to that, not someone else's second-hand statements. As I clearly stated then, the central core vault was built into the depository at the start. Major Tatum's job later on was to build a rapid retrieval system into the gold vault, not to build the vault itself. I also explained that there is a gap of six digits, not twelve, on each floor of vault compartments. My friend, the government is acutely aware of my real charges, so why don't they answer them? What do you think? Notice also in trying to wave aside references to Major Stanley Tatum how cleverly it is done. We can prove that he was there and did oversee the work in the, uh, on the rapid retrieval system, and apparently the government knows we can. 
Uh, therefore, the following sentence is used to mislead without actually lying, and I quote, We have no record of Major Stanley Tatum designing or overseeing the construction of our Central Corps vault, unquote. Of course they don't, because that is just not what he did. He built a rapid retrieval system to give access to the Central Corps vault. The writers of the letter included one other item, which was intended to help throw everyone off the track, but actually does just the opposite. According to our own sources, uh, during the work on the rapid retrieval system in 1942 and 43, the disruption was so great that the gold was taken out of the Central Corps vault and, quote, piled around in the corridors, unquote. Now we are told in this letter about the strange corridor door which was installed for unstated reasons. Listen again to these astonishing words uh, from Mrs. Brooks' letter, and I quote, This work was completed on January 7, 1942, and the number 15 was assigned to the door. After this work was completed, gold was stored in the corridor for a time, during which the door was locked and sealed." Unquote. Mrs. Brooks does not tell us for how long a time, much less why. But thanks to uh, our own information, she doesn't have to tell us. I suggest that you uh, replay Mrs. Brooks' letter all the way through and see for yourself what you will pick up. For example, listen to all the assertions and denials uh, that are all couched in the words, quote, our records show, unquote, or, quote, we have no record, unquote. This, coming from the same office, whose records are so suspect in other ways. Records of the quality of gold stored in Fort Knox and elsewhere, as I have revealed on other occasions, have disagreed with one another in glaring ways. The official mint records omit shipments we can prove from Fort Knox. Even the case of the missing experimental aluminum pennies that has erupted lately is another example of the dependability of United States Mint records. But notice also that the letter spends the least time on the most important matter of all, the radioactive plutonium poison stored in the central core of wool. It is stated that the radiation test by the military, quote, did not disclose any evidence of radioactive material, unquote. In much the same vein, and with similar bureaucratic phrases like, quote, we have no evidence, unquote, the Kentucky Department of Human Resources claims that there is nothing to worry about. But my friend, plutonium radiation is very hard to detect, yet very deadly if it gets inside your body. Experts sum it up with the phrase, if there is enough plutonium to detect, it is already too much. Therefore, nothing less than a serious, comprehensive, honest check by top experts with the best equipment available can be considered satisfactory. The stakes for over 36 million Americans in the southeast United States are too high to settle for less. The United States Government expects you to just Take their word for it, regardless of what they may tell you. No proof, no criteria, just believe what they say. Well, my friend, I do not ask you to do that. I am now going to issue a challenge to the Federal Government, either to confirm or refute my charges about the plutonium poison leaking from the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox openly, fairly, and conclusively. Furthermore, I'm going to state clearly what my criteria are for a test of my charges that I believe the American people could accept and believe in. Here specifically is what I propose. First, formation of a truly Blue Ribbon Committee to test for plutonium poison leakage from the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. This committee to consist of scientists, recognized authorities, fully qualified for such a task. If my challenge is accepted, 
The Committee must include certain individuals whose names I will reveal at that time. The Government may nominate an equal number of scientists to the Committee. However, my nominees will be men who are not uh, my employees or associates, and likewise any members of the Committee nominated by the Government must not be Federal employees unless my own information indicate that they can be trusted. In other words, the Committee must be independent and totally unbiased. Uh, second, this Committee is to be given complete authority and discretion over the conduct of the plutonium poison investigation. They are to be provided at Federal Government expense with any and all technical assistance they may request, as well as the most up-to-date and effective instrumentation. Uh, this must include the 1026 multi-channel analyzer and any other devices they may specify. Uh, they must also have the right, by majority vote of the Committee, to add other experts to their investigating Committee if they deem it necessary. They are not to be interfered with or limited in any way. Uh, should Federal or other authorities choose to impose limitations, the investigating Committee shall be empowered to immediately state any objections they may have to these limitations over live nationwide television and radio so that their message cannot be edited out or reinterpreted by anyone else. Third, upon completion of their investigation, the Investigating Committee shall be granted up to one hour of live broadcast time on nationwide radio and television to present their findings and also their recommendations if my charges are confirmed. I am willing to accept their conclusion as final if it is unanimous and the Federal Government must agree to do the same. There is no time to be lost. If you agree that my proposal is reasonable, start passing the word and applying public opinion pressure to make it happen. Otherwise, the ever-expanding control exercised by the Rockefeller Brothers will prevent it. It is up to you, because the once free, once great major media in America are being gobbled up ever more completely by the Rockefellers. Their latest victim is the mighty Hearst Publishing Empire, whose publications reach a total audience of nearly 86 million adults. This takeover is the bottom line in the tragic Patty Hearst case involving the CIA-financed SLA, a stock transfer to a tax-free foundation controlled by the Rockefellers was the objective, and it has now been accomplished. It's sad that we have to look overseas to see any meaningful reporting about the Fort Knox plutonium disaster. In the Financial Times of London for Thursday, December 11, 1975, the story was broken by C. Gordon Tether, whose financial column is read the world over. In his article titled, A New Twist of Fort Knox Saga, he reviews the Fort Knox gold scandal cover-up and then informs his readers of the latest charges concerning plutonium. He ends the article with words that no columnist of his stature in America has yet dared to write, and I quote, But whatever the cost in terms of loss of face, might not the United States authorities be well advised to do whatever is necessary to demonstrate that there is no Fort Knox cover-up? In the light of what has happened in the United States during the past few years, deeds inevitably now speak louder than words, and a refusal to prove that they have nothing to hide is inevitably destined to go on fostering precisely the opposite impression." Unquote. Topic No. 2. On December 11, 1975, New York City went into default. Hundreds of millions of dollars in city notes came due on that day and the city did not pay as promised. A default is nothing more or less than a failure to pay, and that's exactly what happened. But wait a minute, you may say. President Ford announced that he would ask Congress to give New York City $2.3 billion in loans because New York bailed itself out. What's going on here? What is going on, my friend, is just another Rockefeller shell game. New York City has declared a three-year moratorium, so-called, on payment of $1.6 billion of city notes. Anyone holding one of those notes cannot cash it in for three years and will also receive a lowered rate of interest 
during that time. New York note holders do have another choice, though. Until December 29, a few days from now, uh, these note holders may, if they wish, trade their notes for bonds issued by the Municipal Assistance Corporation, or otherwise known as MAC, on behalf of New York City. These bonds cannot be cashed in for 10 years or more, but they carry a higher rate of interest. And oh yes, there is one other little uncertainty. MAC is a so-called moral obligation agency, an idea given birth by Nelson Rockefeller and his own lawyer, John Mitchell, and its bonds are moral obligation bonds. Its promise to pay the bonds when they come due is not backed up by a legal obligation on the part of New York City, New York State, or anyone else. Either way, the person who simply wants to cash in his city note as it comes due is now out of luck. He can't do it. So New York City is in default. Don't be misled by the fact that the major media under Rockefeller control are not using that word default for the time being. As I pointed out last month in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6, the address rehearsal for default in New York some weeks ago was used to give that word default a very apocalyptic meaning. The word is therefore being saved for the right moment. Meanwhile, the effect of this New York failure to pay is already spreading through our economy. Municipalities all over America and even abroad are suddenly finding it hard to sell their bonds. As the municipal bond market dries up, so will funds for public employees, projects, and so forth. The domino effect has already started, but our advanced revelations have made it dangerous for them to highlight this just yet. But you can be sure that the word default has not been so carefully given its present frightening connotations without a purpose. And it may be that we will all see that purpose within a matter of a few days. A court ruling is due soon uh, concerning the constitutionality of the so-called moratorium imposed by New York. Should it be ruled unconstitutional, financial chaos will be the result in New York, and that chaos will quickly be labeled default. There are a whole string of other time bombs like that, too, all ticking away. When the time is just right, the Rockefeller Brothers can set off whichever one is the handiest. When they do, the results will be the same, regardless of the exact timing. Armed with this knowledge, I hope you will have taken the necessary steps to protect yourself, such as I described in my audio book No. 1 on how to protect yourself during the coming Depression and Third World War. Meanwhile. Gradualism continues to be the word for the step-by-step -step actions of the Rockefeller Brothers. So if you watch the stock market, for example, don't fall into the trap of reading great significance into the daily up-and-down wiggles. What counts is the month-to-month -month trend, and that is down. The stock market crash actually began in July 1975, as I said it would but it does not yet suit the purposes of the Rockefeller Brothers for this to be obvious to all. Instead, the overall market is sinking downward in gradual, almost imperceptible phases. It is crashing in slow motion like a bad dream. Meanwhile, most people, that is, those who do not specialize in the stock market and financial matters, generally keep track of little more than the Dow Jones Industrial Average. There are nearly 2,000 stocks traded on the, on the New York Stock Exchange, but the Dow Index is an average of just 30 of them. They were chosen to be representative of the whole market, assuming no manipulation, but that assumption is no longer correct. Very special attention is paid to the manipulation of prices of these 30 stocks. As a result, the real behavior of the market can be completely hidden from the general public. Wherever a man is involved, races will be fixed. Turning to the monetary picture, a development I first revealed in April of this year has just happened. At the 1975 International Gold and Monetary Conference here in Washington, D.C., I revealed confidential information to the effect that the Soviet Union would soon be issuing an international gold ruble. And just a few days ago it happened. The Soviet Union has introduced their Shravonets, C-H-E-R-V-O-N-E-T-Z, 
or 10 ruble gold piece. It bears the date 1975, and only 250,000 have been minted, 50,000 which are already here in the United States out of 125,000 to be consigned to the United States. Under a 1923 Soviet law, it is legal tender, making it convertible. This new gold coin is an attempt by the Russians for the first time in 52 years to penetrate the world gold coin market and to compete directly with the Kruger Rand issued by South Africa. The Shavanitz is about one quarter the size and value of the Kruger Rand, which means South Africa will have to take uh, measures to compete with it. The other major event supposedly in the monetary sphere is the Monetary Conference so-called at Rambouillet Castle near Paris late last month. Uh, it was a summit meeting of the Big Six, the United States, France, Britain, West Germany, Italy, and Japan. But please note that Canada was not there, and for very good reasons. First here's what happened. Then I will explain why it happened, which is far more important. Treasury Secretary Simon said on his way back from the meeting, uh, which took place over the weekend of November 16, 1975, that a compromise had been reached on exchange rates, among other things. France wanted fixed rates, while the United States had been campaigning for a free float uh, to continue. The compromise that was reached is just what I had told you it would be, stable yet flexible rates of exchange, which they chose to call a managed float. Simon also said he hoped that, quote, the agreement will be approved at an international meeting in January, and that Congress will readily approve necessary changes in the Articles governing the operation of the International Monetary Fund." Unquote. Now a managed float, from a legal point of view, does not require any change in the Articles that govern the IMF unless it changes the par value of gold. So what is brewing now? is a system of so-called stable yet flexible rates of exchange, indirectly tied to a par value of gold. I revealed in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 5 for October 1975 that the plan is to repay gold at or about $195 per ounce, and this is still on track. This in effect will amount to still another devaluation of the dollar, and the official price of gold, $42.22, I will be abolished uh, beginning early next year. Keep in mind that the private gold markets will not be closed, and after this action private gold prices will go past the $195 mark. A leapfrog condition will have been set in motion that will jack the price of gold higher and higher, and the process will be intensified by the coming war and worldwide economic problems. David Rockefeller's gold skyrocket will be launched at last. But the 50 million ounces of gold to be sold by the IMF will never reach the private market, going instead to the central bankers by way of sale, auction, or restitution. Five million ounces of this, returned to the United States under the restitution provision, will be used in an attempt to continue to cover up the Fort Knox gold scandal, along with gold now being smuggled into the United States by the CIA for the private coffers of the Rockefeller brothers. The biggest question about Rambouillet is, why did the United States compromise? The answer is that a free-floating system would be too uncontrollable during the upcoming limited nuclear war against the Arab OPEC nations, which is targeted to begin late in February 1976, just two months from now. So the United States had to compromise to complete its preparations for this war. What I am telling you, my friend, is a military secret, or was until I revealed it in detail in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 last month. The code name for this military attack, by the way, is Operation Cobra, and preparations for it are moving rapidly. Already the first detachment of crack United States Marines are now in Germany, ready for swift deployment into the Sinai, where war will break out and the build-up toward the stage provocation to ignite the conflict, namely an attack on the so-called American advisors in the Sinai, is progressing steadily. Only today, December 21, 1975, the latest step was taken in this plan when a CIA-supported group 
made a provocative attack on OPEC oil ministers at their headquarters in Vienna, Austria. This is intended to lead by stages to reprisal actions against the Americans stationed in the Sinai. Now I turn briefly to Topic No. 3. As I explained last month, the limited nuclear war which is scheduled to begin soon in the Middle East is only a part of a much larger picture. The Rockefeller Brothers have designs on India while the Soviet Union has its eyes on China. In resource-rich Africa, both the Rockefellers and their Soviet allies have an interest. So the real theater in the war now brewing is Asia. After the OPEC oil wells are capped by the nuclear strike, Russia's western flank, Europe, will be crippled, and Africa will be more easily finished off by the guerrilla warfare already going on there. Oil-hungry Japan will be thrown into the arms of Red China, which by the way has just announced it can now export oil, and the stage will be set for the big Asian war that is to be the next round in the bloody game of global monopoly. The strategy of all this was spelled out in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 last month. My purpose now, however, is simply to point out the basic nature of all this. It is, my friend, a drive for control, control of people, of resources, of the entire world. Furthermore, it is the product of an unholy alliance between the State Socialists and the Soviet Union and the Corporate Socialists in the United States, the Rockefeller Brothers, and their client followers. Many people mistake the Rockefeller Brothers for capitalists, but that is not at all what they are. David Rockefeller, for example, has been quoted as saying, I believe in the enterprise system, unquote, but he does not say free, much less competitive enterprise. The entire Rockefeller empire is built on the exact opposite of that, monopolies and trusts. Uh, their major multinational corporations are an ingenious device for casting off loyalties to any country, and they are already more powerful collectively than most nations. The Rockefellers, you see, are corporate socialists. Corporate socialism and state socialism are nothing more than two sides of the same coin. Both boil down to the same thing, dictatorships or near dictatorships enabling a very few people to control everyone else. Once you grasp this fact, the alliance between the Rockefellers and the Soviets will no longer surprise you, nor will the fact that the Russian Revolution in 1917 was financed by the Rockefeller interests. Uh, the State Socialism of Nazi Germany also falls into place, since it too was just another version of the same pattern. In all of these cases, as well as many others we see today, the corporate socialist empire of the Rockefeller Brothers gains handsomely mineral riches, oil, and other rewards in return for cooperation with State Socialism. Thus it is that Secretary of the State Henry Kissinger, a Rockefeller agent for twenty years and more, defends the Soviet Union against charges of cheating on the so-called Salt Arms Limitation Agreement, but allows his outgoing ambassador to Canada to publicly accuse our closest neighbor of being no longer reliable or to be trusted. Kissinger speaks, not for you or me, but for the Rockefeller Brothers. And to them, Russia is the ally, the friend, while our close friends in Canada are the enemy, the people not to be trusted. Because Canada's government now knows what is in the wind, and they are taking all the necessary steps to weather the storm. The Canadian Government wants no part of the coming war, monetary chaos, and all the rest of it, and has privately said so to Kissinger in no uncertain terms. So Canada has become unreliable, which means outside the circle of a firm Rockefeller control. Bravo for Canada! Long may she continue on her independent course. Ultimately, the greedy misdeeds of the Rockefeller Brothers and their allies will be their eventual undoing. Even now, both Nelson Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger have doomed themselves by handling some of the gold that was taken out of Fort Knox. 
That gold was contaminated by the radioactive plutonium-239 superpoison, and now their bodies are contaminated with it. Even though they and the rest of the Rockefeller Organization may well succeed in destroying our Republic if we do not act, they will not live long to enjoy it. What poetic justice! Their dose is even stronger than that received by the congressmen and newsmen who visited the Boylan Depository at Fort Knox in September 1974. Yes, eventually the huge empire of the Rockefeller brothers and their allies will tear itself apart and perhaps destroy the world in the process. But meanwhile, if we do not act now, there will be untold suffering for millions, ourselves, our children, and probably our children's children. Can we possibly sit by and let that happen? Or do we act now while we still can and take back our rightful control over our own destinies? For me, there can be only one choice, and I hope for you as well. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. I wish all of you a blessed Christmas and a healthy, happy, holy New Year. May God bless each and every one of you.